Welcome back to another episode of What Are You Made Of with your boy, the unstoppable. Yes, the stubborn. I got my stubborn shirt on today because I am perversely unyielding. And I want you to be perversely unyielding too. That's why I keep being a role model to all of you for coming and watching these. I just want to keep showing you how to be unstoppable to live in the life of your dreams. But today's a great show, guys. I, I, I'm excited because I met a gentleman out when I was out in LA doing some, some personal work. And uh, got to sit right next to him at, the, at a dinner. Had no idea who the hell he was. He didn't know who I was, but we hit it off. And I wanted to bring him on here to share his story and share what he's made up today. We have, we have Munich with us. Uh, he's an Emmy and DJ nom, DJA nominated writer producer whose work includes creating stars, the, the network stars, highest rated show in the network's history, Force. Other credits include Empire, Gang Related, DirecTV's Ice, BT's Tales, and Vital Signs which starred Dr. Dre, Sam Rockwell, Ian McShane, and the late Michael K. Williams. He's currently adapting the memoir, California Soul, for Paramount Plus, and probably has a ton of other things in his, in his mind and brain and creativity that's going to be coming out as well. So you, you guys got to know this guy, but we got to hear his story. Munich, welcome to the show, brother. Thank you so much for having me, man. That was, uh, that was quite a dinner we were at, man, but it was, it was, it was an instant moment between the two. So it's like they sat us next to each other because they knew we would vibe. Yeah, yeah, I, I agree. You know? yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, uh, and, I, and I'm glad they did. And then I sat there and I was absolutely blown away because, you know, I've only been going to LA for, like for, I don't know, the last year and a half popping out there every quarter or so often. And, and I've been running into some of the greatest people that I've ever met in my life. And, you know, like the fact that, and I was sharing this with you before I get into the question, I'm going to go off top or uh, off the uh, track a little bit here for a second, but I, I postulated that I wanted to be in the, in the films or movie or TV. And I, I had no idea what, what that meant or how that, like how the hell I would ever do that. Cause I had no connections whatsoever. And that was about six months to a year ago. And I just, it just kept hitting me like, yeah, I gotta be, I gotta, I gotta be in this man. I'm, I'm made for the camera. And, and, I, and I have so many ideas. Like I just, I didn't say that myself, right? Like this is something right. that just comes to me. And so I don't know if people can uh, relate to that or not, but I know you can. And so I said, fuck it. So I started writing it down. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like if it's here, I'm not going to yeah. argue with it. And all of a right. sudden, you're not the only one, but all these people started coming in my life that have to do with film and TV. And I'm like, this is wild, man. Like this shit really works. So then I said to myself, I'm going to see how far I can take this thing. So when, when I was going to start doing some work with um, L. Ron Hubbard stuff, I said, you know what? I'm going to LA for this. I'm not going to go to a local org. I'm going I'm to go to LA, man. I'm going to go right to Hollywood and, and, and just let's see what happens. And so I started meeting people and it's just, I have no idea where this is going to go. I have a vision. Um, I'm pretty clear with it, but how to get there, all that's not clear, but it's just wild how things work like that, man. Well, I think it's like, you know, that saying, man, like what you put out is what you bring in. So if that energy is there, right, you'll, you'll pull it in, right? It just, it is, man. And water draws to its own level. So it's, it's interesting in, in that, man. So if like, if people have been telling you this for a minute, and like, yo, you got to do this. You got to do this. And all, of course, you're going to draw that energy in. But, it's, but, but, we, but, we, but we hear that, right? Like, like we, we hear all these quotes and we hear all these things that are law of attraction. We hear all this. Right. But 99% but, but, but of people don't believe it. And then they never experience it. Am I right? Yeah, for sure, dude. But I also think 99% of people are afraid of it. You know what I'm saying? Like, yeah, the power of it, people, right? But like, people are just fear-based, right? Like, you know, it's, it's so interesting, man. It's like people, if that door is open, or even if they see that door, people are just afraid to like go through it. Right. It's like, what's on the other side. It's the unknown. Right. And that's what trips people the fuck out. So I think they have this block that they put on themselves, but like if people have been telling you something, you know, it's like, for instance, you talk about someone who you hear them singing one day, you're like, Oh my God, that person's a great singer. That's a great singer. You got to do this. You got to do it. enough people do it. They're going to start pulling it in. Right. But if they don't believe it, right, they don't acknowledge it in themselves. But then they ain't ever going to walk through that door when it's open. You could open 50 doors from them. They'll never step through it. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So, yeah, that was cool that we were seated next year. Well, well and you, you know what else, too? Like, uh, I think uh, you talk about the fear thing. Like a lot of people say, oh, it's fear of failure. Fear of no, I think it's fear of the power. Like you think about this. If you truly have control of your life that you can accomplish really whatever the hell you want to. Now I can't dunk a basketball maybe, right? Physically, you know, like on a 10 foot rim, I might be able to, if I really worked at it, but I'm five, six and three quarters. Right. But I'm talking right. about other things, right? Like if you really, really realize that power was there, that scares the shit out of some people. I actually think about it myself. It's like, what the, f like, that's scary. 
Absolutely. It's yeah, terrible. Yeah. Well, that's that's what stops people, right? Yeah, yeah, that's yeah. That's what stops people. It's what holds people back. You know, what comes with what comes with that once you make that move, what comes with it, right? Because there's responsibility behind it. Right. Yeah, and yeah. if you get there and you're not willing to accept the responsibility that comes with that role of evolution and growth, then you then now have a fear of being exposed, right? Because someone's gonna find out that you're faking it, right? That you're not supposed to be there. It's just there's a whole kind of it's a cycle, man. So yeah. like at the end of the day, like you just hope you got enough of a foundation, whatever that is. So when that door is open and you step through, you're prepared and you surround yourself with people, right? You know, yep, it's, it's yep. interesting, man. I know you're going to hit me with that question in a second, right? But uh, but I'll tell you a story. You talked a little bit about how I did this project with uh, Dr. Dre. And Dre is one of the most fascinating dudes I've ever been around in my life. This man is the apex of creativity. This man is the apex of success on so many levels, right? Has accomplished and conquered everything he set out to do, yeah? And one night we're sitting there and it's four o'clock in the morning and we're writing this TV series together. And I said to him, I said, Dre, you, you've done it, man. Like you've, you've really, you've done what 99.999% of people will never accomplish in their lives, right? What, what drew you to want to do a TV series with me, right? What was it? And he said, you know, Munich, at this point in my life, I just want to surround myself with people I want to learn stuff from. I just want to keep learning. And it was such a moment for me. It was such a crystallization moment for me of like, here's this guy who's regarded as the best music producer, not just in hip hop. I've seen Dre conduct a jazz symphony. I've seen Dre sit down at the piano and bang out beautiful classical music that, you, that would mm -hmm. rip your head off, right? He's a, I mean, he is, the way his mind works is incredible. And the fact that here he is at this point in his life and he still wants to learn every day something and surround himself with people he could learn from. That was amazing. And I, I carry that forward in my own life, in my own practices every day. I just want to surround myself with people that I could learn from. Surround yourself with people who are smarter, better equipped, better skilled at certain things because you want to keep learning from them. Yep. A hundred percent, man. I, I, and I hit that. I think I hit that at 40. It took me till 40 to start really like, shit, I need to, I need to learn, man. I dropped out of college. Anyway, let's get to back to the, let me get back on track. Cause I'm, I'm going to kick my own ass here in a minute. Uh, <laughs> so Munich, let's go here, man. What are you made of brother? Um, what am I made of, man? Uh, I think I'm made out of like uh, a willingness and a wildness. You know, that, that has kind of been my, my secret recipe. Right. And, and when I say that, it's like a willingness to experience anything, right? Like good, bad, indifferent, whatever it is. And then, and then take something from each experience. Right. Like, you know, listen, man, you, you ain't worked in a day in your life until you've been fired. Right. That's when you know what the fuck you're really made of when you get fired. And I've been fired, dude. I've been fired several times right off big projects off big shows i've been rewritten i've been promised and handshaked and man we can't wait to see you on set never heard from the cats again go make my script whatever right i've been replaced and all this other stuff right and and you got to step back in those moments and you go okay well it ain't about them i had a part in that what was my part in that oh okay i could see that oh i could see that i could see that right but it's when you're down man and how you get back up and then that's where the wildness comes in and it's you know i was raised you know i was raised a fighter i was raised you know my father was an immigrant to this country you know came to this country in 1952 who was a holocaust survivor who, who had nothing right started out as a dishwasher ended up buying the restaurant within two years you know had us working in that restaurant from the time we we're three and a half not like some kind of cute kid shit like filled with salt and pepper shakers right but like get out fucking, you know, 25 below zero, unload the trucks with everyone, bring them <laughs> back into the restaurant, the toilets. You know, I remember one time he says, come here, you got to come down to the bathroom with me. And we go down to the bathroom and I smell, you know, you can tell immediately there was a problem with the toilet was clogged and he, he handed me a plastic bag. He said, pull it up to your shoulder. I said, why? He goes, you're going in. Right. And I had to take my whole arm, you know, just start <laughs> clogging. And, and and it's just that that was a work ethic. Right. Like and, and and what I love about it, it was a wildness. Right. 
is while other kids were going to play little league and other kids were doing the stuff and it was still dope. Like we had an opportunity to do all that, but it was like responsibility to the family first. There was a wildness. If you got to get up at four in the morning and go to work with your old man, you went to work. If you got in a fight, my dad's advice was always, you don't go in there and talk and try to fucking figure your way out of it. If you got yourself into a situation where you got to throw hands, make sure you land the first punch. Don't stand there and talk, right? And when you land that punch, break someone's nose. That's, that was, that's the advice you grew up with, right? So the, the willingness is the, the spiritual side of how I want to approach everything. The wildness is, you know, I made a career in this business for 30 plus years, 35 years, man. I came out to LA to be an actor, had a fake resume, didn't know nobody out there, lied, ended up on a TV show. They're like, yo, uh, we called the union. You're not in the union. You're not in Screen Actors Guild. I said, no, I know that. They said, but your resume says Screen Actors Guild. I'm like, yeah, well, I saw that shit in a bookstore and everyone's resume said SAG, so I just put it on mine, <laughs> right? You know, bullshit on my way, ended up on a TV series, you know? Um, never took a writing class, sold my first script, you know? And so that's that's the wildness. My boys who I'm tight with out here, they call me a pirate, right? They're like, dude, you're a fucking pirate. You're just like one of these cats who's had this unconventional career, but like you keep doing it, man. Like, you know, a lot of a lot of people will tap out at that point, but like, it's just this wildness in me where it's like, I refuse to accept the traditional route. Yeah, there's something cool about it. And I've had great experiences and I will continue to do so. Um, but I love the wildness that, you know, I, I bring to kind of everything I do, you know. Can I share something with you, man? Personally, yeah. I, uh, after meeting you out in LA, um, you know, where I was, I was out there studying and learning and stuff. And I had cognitions and while I was out there going through some stuff. But really, I got something from you that... While I was actually in, 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 in a session, I started thinking to myself, like, you know, you get all this shit out there on social media that tells you, man, you got to wake up early. You got to do this. You got to do that. Right. You go to, and you hear all this stuff and you're like, well, if I don't do that, I'm not going to be successful. Then I started thinking to myself because of you, when I was sitting next to you listening to your story and, and all that, and I was in session, I realized like, no, 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 no. I'm, I'm, I'm writing a story. Like I, I, I do what I, I'm going to be successful because I'm me. I, I want to do it the way I want to do it. If I feel like sleeping in one day, I'm going to fucking sleep in one day, right? If, if I want to stay up late with my wife and I get up at four, I'm going to do that. But then there's other days I'm going to get up at four. But there doesn't have to be a routine just because somebody else says there's a routine. Routines are for people that aren't like me. Yeah, so I have this cognition, like the wild part, what you're talking about. As long as I'm committed to what I want to do and I'm clear on it and I'm, I'm not going to quit because I'm freaking stubborn and inexorable, then I'll do it the way I want to do it. And that, that, that wildness, what you just said, which really hit me right now, is because I came home from that trip thinking that way. And it was freeing. It was freeing right. that I didn't have to like fit in to these, to these ridges. You know what I mean? Absolutely. And I think, look, I think we all want to be able to write our own story, right? Like we all, we all want to be able to write our own story. We all want to be able to create our own narrative. And look, that means coexisting with other people, right? That means societally, we have to figure out where we fit in and where we work best and like where we could like be of service and, and be the best versions of ourselves. And sometimes you align yourself with people that have that same energy and vision and sometimes you don't. And that's when it becomes oil and water, right? But it's true, man. It's like, yeah, there are days where like, yeah, I'm gonna take a day off from the gym or oh shit, I'm gonna eat this. Or I'm going to not write, you know, I'm not going to get up and start banging keys at like 530 in the morning. I'm going to go play golf or some shit first. Right. And then I'll come back to it. So there's, you know, and, and that's OK, too. Right. I think, you know, that's it's, it's kind of like what do you call it? like the cheat meal. Right. Yeah. yeah. Philosophy. Like that's not going to set you back. Like if you go out and you have a pizza and a Sunday and a piece of chocolate cake one night. Like, that's not going to fuck up the last six months of what you've been doing. That's not going to fuck up the last six weeks, the last year of what you've been doing. Right. So what are those what are those like emotional cheat meals? What are those spiritual things you can do for yourself? Because everything you bring to the table, you just want it to enrich you. Right. Yeah. As, as you figure it all out. And that's really what it comes down to. We're just figuring this out, man. We're just like we're just like pachinko balls bouncing around. But like. Once you really harness that energy, man, then you really are in a place where you're like, okay, this works for me. This doesn't work for me. Shit that don't work for me anymore. You know, the older I get, right. I got to start pushing it out of the way. People who don't work with me, I got to push that out of the way. 
And, and by the way, I got to figure out what my part in is in every relationship first, right? And I was saying the other day um, to these people I had just met, I said, you know, it's like the older I get, right? My heart gets bigger, but my circle gets smaller. Yeah. Right? And yeah. that's kind of how I live my life now. My heart is huge, man, right? But the circle of the people, I got to be real selective now of kind of who's a part of that circle, right? Whereas before, I would fucking throw a circle as big as Texas and everyone was welcome. And I didn't know who was who, who was up to what, who wanted what, what was my friend, what was someone trying to get over on me, you know? So it's, yeah. it's just interesting, man. And I think a lot of that just comes with self-awareness and, 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 and having the abilities to kind of figure that out. Yeah, 100. So, so yeah, I love it, man. Uh, going back, man, take us back because I heard some of your story before, but like take us back from where you came from and growing up before you got to L.A. And yeah. the, the, the track that you took wasn't necessarily yeah. the best track. But yeah, you want to share no. some stories from that? Maybe some. No, uh, I mean, look, man, I was just I was just a wild fucking nut bar. You know, I grew up <clears throat> I grew up in a neighborhood in Chicago. Um, you know, it was a lot of us were first generation right? Italian, Greek, Asian, um, Jewish, but like, you know, a lot of our parents were immigrants, right? And we kind of grew up in this, this spot it was just about 10 minutes north of the city. Um, but it, it, it gave us like this incredible, gave me an incredible foundation and understanding of, you know, a being a part of something bigger, but also like watching how my family operated from a really young age and form how I wanted to be as, as I got older and, and, and grew up. And I made a lot of stupid choices. Like I had great parents, man. I had parents who were invested. I had parents who were uh, involved, but you know, I was also a kid who was super hyperactive, right? Uh, they used to call it hyperactivity. You know, I couldn't sit through a class. I'd get up and walk around. I'd blurt shit out at teachers. That was inappropriate. I was getting suspended constantly. Um, you know, to my mom's credit, when I was younger, this is like the birth of Ritalin, right? Yeah, and all yeah. This other shit. And they said to my mom, I think I was probably like six or seven or something. And they said, you know, we 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 want to put your son on uh, this new drug because he can't sit still and he can't focus and he's, he's not learning at the pace of everyone else. And my mom said, well, maybe he learns like different ways. You ever think of that? Well, when you're part of Chicago public school system or these other public school systems, and I don't fault the system, they have a job to do. Their job is to get you through. But so my mom said, no, there's no way my kid's going on meds. Like there's no way my kid's going on medication. So they were great in that regard and they were incredibly supportive but I made a lot of stupid decisions. I got involved with a lot of bad people, you know? And um, I was living this kind of all through high school, man. It was funny, I was kind of living this double life. There was one side of me that people were like, oh look, he won the cherry pie baking contest in home ec, right? You know, which I did by the way, it's one of my greatest <laughs> I'm, not I'm not gonna forget that. I'm not gonna forget that, dude. I won the cherry pie baking contest, check it out. The crust I did on the top, I made look like a like almost like a spiral staircase, dude. I cut each strip and layered it in, so it kept building and building and building. Up. I won that shit. That was like literally, I have a plaque to this day, dude. I'm so proud of. You gotta understand. The only reason I got through high school is I literally cheated on every test I ever took in high school. I never took a straight exam in my life, right? I would write the answers in my gum wrapper, and then I chew the gum, and then I'd have all the answers in the gum. I would steal shit out of people's hands who were just walking. I was just that guy, but I couldn't learn, right? I just, I didn't have the ability to learn. Education was beyond my grasp. I had too many misunderstood words. I couldn't comprehend shit. So while all these kids are like going on a prom and homecoming and dances and Friday night football games, I'm running around downtown with the underbelly of Chicago, man, getting involved in all kinds of nuts. So shit, you know, that, that really got to the point where, you know, started to jeopardize uh, my life, the lives of people I loved. And I was like, yo, I got to figure some stuff out. So when I was done with high school, I really, the one thing that really drew my focus more than anything was acting. I was one of the youngest people to perform in second city in Chicago. Um, I was anything that's shot in Chicago. I was an extra on it. I didn't give a shit. Um, <clears throat> so after high school, I said to my mom and dad, I said, I just want to move to LA and be an actor. 
my parents knew I was just out of control. I was wild, man, right? They're like, you're not going to LA, right? You're too wild and we're too, it's not gonna happen right now. Like, and we never went to college. We didn't have a chance to go to college. We want all our children to go to college. I said, well, I didn't apply to college. And then my dad said, cool. And he handed me a brochure for the Marines. He's like, so then you can go to the Marines for four years, figure it out when you're 21, then you can move to LA. I said, well, yeah, let me look into some colleges. Cause I knew if I went in the military, man, it wasn't that I, I had a fear of joining the military. And in hindsight, I wish I had joined the Marines for four years or the army to kind of get some structure in my life. But because I was so wild and out of control, I said, where could I go to college that will take me right now with horrible grades, with no SAT, with an ACT, I think I scored it with my brother the other night, I think I scored like a 16 on my ACT. And I was like, oh shit, Arizona State University will take anyone, right? And it's close to California. So I applied to ASU and I got in, like total fluke, man. Never went to class, drove to LA every Thursday afternoon, hung out in LA would sit there with like a fake script dude and like Jerry's Deli and pretend I was starring in movies trying to get discovered man like it was like the 50s or some shit uh, uh, you know again here I am sitting in Tempe Arizona never going to class uh I'm dealing drugs I'm taking copious amounts of drugs and I'm like I gotta get out of here man like I don't you know I don't want to be just like this and I don't want to waste my parents money so I loaded up my jeep and I drove to Cali I didn't tell my parents uh, I said, hey, mom, dad, I'm in California. Uh, I decided to do it. And they said, not surprised. Uh, give a call to our friend's friend's daughter. She works in Hollywood. Like that was all they knew, man. And she was like a production account, Bonnie Weiss. She like saved my life, dude. She's Are you like, serious? Wow. Yeah, dude. She's like, she's like, yeah, cousin, you could crash on my couch. Because she was a production counter, right? So I'm like, it was amazing. She said, like, you crash on my couch for a week till you find a place. That turned into like, I don't know, bro six seven months then i was then then another cousin moved in and i think i was sleeping under the pinball machine for a while in her family room until i got my shit together but i started clicking real quick you know within within being here for six months man again i lied my way into an agency i lied my way into an audition i've had my first job i ever did was a commercial a levi's 501 commercial with this new director uh who was just on the come up his name was david fincher Right. Like, dude, like, can you imagine I'm doing 501 commercials with David Fincher? Jeez. And that got me that got me into the union. And then I went in on an audition for a TV show um, and I booked my first audition and my first one out of the gate. Right. I lied my way into an agency. My resume was bullshit. They submitted me. I booked it. It was for a guest lead on Jake and the Fat Man. I had to be in Hawaii in 24 hours. I had no paperwork, <laughs> I had no union card. And I just was like, I, I said, look, was I the best actor for the job? Yes or no? And he said, well, that's irrelevant. I said, no, that's all that's relevant. Was I the better actor for the job? Because if I wasn't, hire the next kid. But if I was, then I got to go to Hawaii and do this TV show. And they're like, God damn, who is this kid? And, uh, you know, 48 hours later, I was on a plane to Hawaii with my agent. I took her as a gift. I didn't know, like, I was first class, dude. First time I ever flew first class. And what do I do? I cashed him my first class ticket for two coach so I could take my agent with me. Right. And I took her to Hawaii. Um, but uh, that's just how I'm operated, man. You know, I just I just put my head down, man. Same with writing. Never wrote before. Right. Sat down, wrote a script, sent it to my agent. He goes, man, fuck you. You think you're a writer? That's what he said. You think you're a writer? Because you know how many actors think they know how to write? He goes, I'm not I'm not going to read your script. I said, you really you don't want to read my script? He goes, no, man. And I'm not Kinko's and I'm not making fucking copies for you either. Right. He said, we make money off you. We make good money off you as actor. I'm like, so you don't want to read my script, bro? He said, no, fuck no. And he hangs up the phone. I give that script to my then lawyer at the time. She reads it. She goes, yo, this is crazy, right? I still think it's one of the best titles of a script I ever wrote. It's called Mayonnaise and Margaritas. It was, <laughs> it was literally, dude, it was Clueless meets Scarface about a foreign exchange student who shows up in a small town in Illinois. And it turns out he's basically like Escobar's son. Oh my like, yeah. He is into coke mules, but it was a comedy. <laughs> So she reads it and she's like, yeah, let me send it out to a few production companies. She sells it in 72 hours, right? So then I was like, oh, I'm in it. So this agent calls me and he's like, yo, we just heard you sold your script. I said, yeah. And he goes, you didn't think we should read it? I go, hey man, do me a favor. He said, what's that? I said, go fuck yourself, <laughs> right? And I said, fuck everyone at the agency. It was a huge agency, right? One of the top threes. And I hung up the phone and that was it. And that's how I became a writer. Then I took that money and I said, well, I want to direct a movie now. 
Well, have you ever directed? No. Do you know how to direct? No. Do you know how to look through a camera? Not really. But I was working with people like Richard Donner at the time as an actor, and he gave me my break to direct this little PSA. I was working with directors like Laszlo Kovacs, who shot fucking Easy Riders, which is one of my top three movies of all time. So Laszlo was telling me how to look through cameras. So I took my money. My old man stepped up and he said, look, you dropped out of college. I said, yeah. He said, well, we put money aside for you to go to college. You've been in L.A. for a few years. You've been making it as an actor. We're really proud of you. So the money we save for you for go to college, go make the movie here. So my old man put forward my college tuition and I put together every penny I had. And I went out from 70 grand, dude. We shot this movie in 10 days. Everything I had sold my car on the ninth day because we ran out of money. Had a brand new Jeep, sold it for film stock. Right. Again, I didn't have no I had no idea how to do this shit. Jeez. Made this movie, put in a bunch of festivals, and won a bunch of awards. I got signed by a bigger agency. Um, they said, Hey, you want to work in TV? I said, Yeah, I love writing TV. I'd never written fucking TV in my life. <laughs> right. <laughs> going for a meet, going for a meeting with this production company. Like, what do you got? I'm like, let me just go through the Rolodex of bullshit. I'm like, hey, how about this show? They're like, oh, that's a great idea. Cool, we'll buy it. Next thing you know, I'm writing a pilot for TV, right? And that's literally how how it just. Damn. Well, so, so yeah. like, how how what, what, like you don't have to tell the exact amount of what, if you don't want to, but that first script, like, what kind of money are we talking about when you sell that? Oh man, it was you know for me at the time, dude. It was you know any amount of money as a writer. Yeah, yeah, know, yeah. Was, no, I get it. It was life changing, but. but I, but like, I, like, put it this way, dude. I remember the first year I moved to LA, right? I was 18 years old and 19 years old. And I remember the, my, just my first year out here as an actor. I'll never forget, dude. I made $78,750, right? As an actor, right? And I was like, yo, made it, right? Because, dude, <laughs> yeah. you're, calling, you're making that kind of yeah. money. You're 19 years old, right? So it was like, and then the next year is like, oh man, you made six figures. Your next year, out, you know, and you're 20 years old, right? And then it, it starts to become this thing of like, oh, I could do this, right? Now there have been times, obviously, over the years where I've been part of huge deals that have fallen apart. I've been part of shows that, you know, I'm like, oh, if I stay on this for X amount of years, it'll materialize and monetize into this, and they fell apart, right? So you, you chalk those up, right? Those those become the learning experiences. Those become the losses. There have been hard times, you know, over the years. And, and, and again, choices I was making, right? Even after I was like, kind of got my foot in the door, I would still do dumb shit, right? I would get my foot in the door and then I kick myself in the teeth because I couldn't get out of my own way, right? So fired that agent. I didn't like how that agent was representing me. This didn't work out. Why didn't you do that? And kind of that mentality. So the money just, you know, if, 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 if you do it right in any business, whether it's mine, yours, or whatever it is, you, you, you want to have an increase in your income, obviously, because then, you know, that's, that's how you continue to grow and to flourish. But yeah, I mean, I can't, I have my contract for that script somewhere, dude, but I just remember at the time I was like, oh my God, I sold a script. What happened you know? to it? What happened to it though? After they bought it? Oh, uh, then it went through like, then it went through the machine. Well, again, right. That then you get your taste, right? It's like, oh my God, I, so I'm going to make a movie. You ain't going to make a movie. There's so many channels that it has to go through. And so many people have to say yes. And so many people. And then they're like, Hey, can we rewrite it? Yeah. Can you cut down the whole drug running aspect of it? Well, that's the whole movie. I know right. maybe they'd be doing something else. Well, no, because then it's not mayonnaise and margaritas. Then it's something else. Well, right. Can you pull back on? Well, we want to go for a PG-13. Can you pull out the, the scene where the kid comes in? Can you take change? The, and then it starts to become something else. Right. Right. So then, you know, after developing it with them for over a year, it just reverted back to me and they ended up not making it. And, you know, and, and that became an interesting thing because as a writer, what's so fascinating is, and this was something, you know, my parents never, you know, it, it conceptually it was something for them that was very foreign, which was like, as a writer, you can make a tremendous living as a writer, tremendous living as a writer. Right. But most of your shit doesn't get made. Right. But you still get paid for everything you write, every step of the deal. You get paid. So my parents would be like, you know, every time, you know, sell this pilot, sold that movie, wrote this movie, wrote that pilot, sold this to Universal, sold that to Paramount, sold that to Warner Brothers. So like the money's coming in and it's great, but the product's not coming out because of whatever reasons a lot of stuff gets caught in development. They decide yep. to make this pilot instead of that pilot. 
you, so it's an interesting game, right? And that's why I think, you know, it's, it's a numbers game for a lot of reasons, but you also don't want to burn out on that shit. And that's where the wildness comes in. I'm like, yo, I jumped on that bull 35 years ago and I ain't like, oh, that motherfucker yet. You know, most <laughs> people, they go eight, right? Eight seconds. That's considered yep. a good ride. Yep. Right? I've been doing this shit for 35 years. I'm still holding on. Like, yeah, let's go. And, and you know, there's a common theme. And I, I heard your story, like I said, when we were at dinner and, and you told a story about something recently where you just like said, you know what, this isn't going the way I want it. And you made the decision that you, you, you're non-negotiable with some of your, your standards. And yeah. so it seems like this has happened over your career that, that my theme from this, you know, with all my businesses right now, and I'm talking to all my employees going from now until 2020, 2023, when we're going into that is go from okay to phenomenal. Like we're, we're not, we're, we're going to give up. Okay. We don't, we don't want to just survive. Like, fuck that. We're going, we're going all the way. And then we can always fall back to, okay. If we need to, because if you're at okay, you, you, the, the only falling back is not okay. You know, so, so, but you seem like you've done that at times where you were okay. And then you're like, no, 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 I'm going this way, you know? And uh, I love that. I love that. Like that's a, that, that's a, yeah. So look, you go through it continually in your business, right? And you go, oh, so if this is okay, and that's, that's the safety net that you could always fall back and spring back up from okay. Right. Cause okay. will always be there. I don't, I don't want that net anymore, man. I'd rather go all the way and be like, climb as high as you can and be like, yo, pull the okay net. Yep. Right. Cause yep. if I fall from here, I want to fuck. Right. I don't want to fall to okay. Right. Okay. Is not a comfortable place for me. Right. I, d- I don't want to be okay. I don't, I don't want to be okay in my work. I don't want to be okay in my relationships. I want to be phenomenal. I want to be, I want to do something different. You know, I want to continue you know, I, I, I said one night on, on the job I was working on, and people were acting all kinds of horrible, abhorrent, just terrible behavior. And I'm sitting there and I'm watching these people who are making millions of dollars carry on so poorly. And, and I stopped and I said, yo, your behavior is so unexcusable. It's just so inexcusable how everyone's carrying on right now. Like, we're making entertainment, right? I said, look, I wish I was curing pediatric cancer i wish i had that yeah yeah trust me dude i would do it tomorrow right i said but this is my skill set this is what i'm good at this is what i believe i should be doing right and if we all can't recognize that and come together then i can't be a part of that because you know what that's okay and people would say their behavior is okay right 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 no it's not okay it's good enough it's it's not okay when you're physically assaulting a wardrobe person or you're knocking over a craft service table because your breakfast burrito had tomatoes in it and you didn't want tomatoes and you flip a table and everyone goes, it's okay. Yeah. I'm the one going, yo, it's not okay. We can't accept okay in anything we do really, right? We all have to strive to be better than okay. So what does that look like in all our lives? Hundred percent, man. I love it, and and you, you put your foot down. I mean, by the end of the day, and you have confidence that you know what, if this doesn't go work, I I I'm good enough. Like I I trust. I will bet on myself every day that I'm going to be okay. Like I I'm not okay, but like I'm going to be. I'll be able to get more work, <laughs> yeah. right? You know, that's you got to have that. So, um, yeah. and, and a couple questions as we wind down here. When you are writing, where do you get your inspiration from? And if you ever come into a spot where you just don't feel creative, what do you, what is your go to, to to get out of that? Not creative um, feeling. I think for me, it's um, I pull on everything, man. I pull on my life a lot. I pull on, I pull on, kind of how I grew up, where I grew up. You know, I just, I just had a meeting the other day, kind of pitching this network in the studio, a part of my life from when I and and where I grew up and the people I encountered. And I always, you always come, you always drink from that well of familiarity, right? Mm-hmm. Because it's a great jump off. Right. And because I had such an unorthodox upbringing and because I had such an unorthodox run up until I met my wife, quite honestly, who saved my life 20 years ago. Right. That's a great story, you know? too, by the way. That we're, oh, yeah. We, yeah, we don't have to go into it today, but I just wanted to just tell you that. <laughs> but, but like my, my wife literally saved my life. I mean, I think I told you on the day I met her, you know, uh, 
few hours before I met her, I was choking a dude in a Miata convertible for taking my parking spot. <laughs> and then I meet this angel in Whole Foods like six hours later. Like talk <laughs> about the ebb and flow. You know? um, but uh, I, I get my, I, that's where I pull my inspiration from, you know? And, or I pull it, you know, I've been having a lot of um, love lately and a lot of success finding other stories that inspire me and locking up life rights. You know, we have these, these two projects right now that I saw their stories online. Um, and I just, I, I literally chased these two guys down, individuals, um, and locked up their life rights because their stories are so remarkable and so beautiful and so inspiring. And I felt compelled to tell these stories. So I go out and I option their life rights. Um, books and literature i'm doing a graphic novel adaptation right now which really moved me um a short story that was just sent to me which is remarkable those inspire me um and when i hit a wall dude and i just can't fucking sit there and look at my computer and get my fingers dancing dude i just get up and i walk away from it and i go for a hike right or i go uh get on my motorcycle right and go for a ride or i go to the gym Right. Or I just fucking lay down and just sit there. You know, I, I have to reconfigure this pilot I'm doing right now. And I haven't touched it in like 10 days, which for me is like unbelievable to like step away. And then all of a sudden, four o'clock in the morning, I crystallized how to rewrite the pilot. Right. And how did it happen, dude? I was putting hot sauce on my dinner. I'm like, yo, this is how I want to open the show with this runner with some hot sauce. And all of a sudden, then I'm like, oh, that leads into that scene. And then that scene. And then all of a sudden, fucking because I'm putting some fucking Franks on my dinner, I now figured out how to fucking break the <laughs> pilot. And it came that way. Oh, so out shit. Out of the weirdest places, dude. And literally, that's literally, I'm like, I can't figure out how to re-break this fucking pilot. And I love this pilot so much. And the studio's notes are great. I just have to figure out my job to address it. How do I get there? How do I get there? And I'm putting all this Franks on my dinner. And I'm like, Okay, cool. So instead of doing that at the grave site, he does this at the grave site. And oh shit. And now it does this and it moves it. And I'm like, got it. Now I can sit down and be like, and get through it and deliver the script that they want. And you, do you sometimes when you, after you write something, you read like, oh, this is shit. And then, oh. and then, but then when you do that, that could be like other people love it. Like, how do you, like, you know what I mean? Like, oh yeah, dude. Oh yeah. I, I call it the, the vomit drafts, the diarrhea drafts. Where you just like, you're like, I just got to get this out of my system right now. Right. And then you start peeling it back and reshaping it. And look, there have been things that I thought were like fucking, you know, case in point, dude, I've been doing this shit for a long time. And I wrote a script that I thought was the best thing I ever read, attached an actor who I fucking love, attached a huge producer. And we took it out to get it made as a TV series. And everyone's like, no, we're good. They're like, script's great, but we're good. Package is great, but we're good. And no one, no one made it. It just happened, you know, and you go, okay, I think it's literally best thing I ever wrote. All right, got it. No one wanted to fuck with it. I'll put it in a drawer, right? I'll put it in a drawer. And in a few years, I'll dust it off. I'll rework it. I'll figure it out. We'll take another swing at it. But like, I put everything behind that script, dude, right? I believed in it so wholeheartedly and no one bought it. Damn. So it's like, you know, it's, it's writing is subjective as a motherfucker, man. Writing is so subjective. It's art. Right. And so it's like, I could think shit is great. Other people be like, nah, it's not working. And I could turn something in where I'm like, yeah, it was a solid, a solid B. And people are like, yo, we're making this shit. I'm like, great. You know, so it's just, you know, it varies, but you, you try to align yourself in a way that, you know, everyone has the same vision and the same goal to strive towards the same thing. So as we wind down, man, like going to the last question here, like what's the vision for the future? Like what, what would be the perfect finale for you going out like from here to your death like what is what is it that you're got your sights set on from here till my death wow uh well hopefully that's like in another 85 years yeah long time uh <laughs> but you know man i think honestly i i feel like if, if i tapped out tomorrow i feel like i did a lot of things really beautifully and really right truthfully i don't have regrets in my heart um I think for me, the one thing I want to do, honestly, man, this is no bullshit. I just want to be a better version of myself today than I was yesterday and tomorrow better than I am today and just kind of keep being that person, right? And, and at the end of the day, man, if a couple of people come across my path and they're like, yo, man, that dude, there was something about him, right? 
or that dude, even if they're like, yo, fuck that dude. Right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, fuck that. And there are people, like, there's people in this business, like, you pick up the phone and call four people, you might get four different reactions. Hopefully, yeah. you get three great ones. Oh, we love that guy. And someone will be like, yeah. And one might be like, fuck that dude. That's okay too. Right. But for me, the future looks like, how do I just continue to be a better version of myself every day? Right. How do I give myself to the people I love? How do I give to the people who need something from me? How do I stop this truck from backing up? Over <laughs> I, me right I, now? I barely hear it. I barely hear it. <laughs> oh, okay. I barely hear it. Um, yeah. uh, my, Lizard is up on me right now. But I hear it now. Yeah. Me, yeah. But for me, honestly, dude, that's from now until the day I die. Just be the best version of myself. Love it. And I love really it. Man. Hopefully lift uh, up people around me the best I can. All right, man. Well, I'm going to help you do that too. So I'm going to keep uh, uh, encouraging you and, uh, and we'll do that together, man. So thank you for being here, Munich, man. Good dude. Uh, I'm glad I've got connected with you and uh, I look forward to doing something. I, I have, I have some freaking sick ideas in my head and uh, you're the dude that would uh, probably be crazy enough to freaking execute on it. But uh, I want to thank you for being here. I want to thank Always. Yeah. Thanks to the audience for being here, guys. Thanks. Keep coming back. Rate us. Go subscribe on your favorite podcast platform or watch these on YouTube where you can watch the video and see our handsome faces. And until next time, be unstoppable.